sometimes um, we look at our little life and our little impact and our little work and, and feel kind of insignificant, but actually um, what we're doing is a, is a brave thing in this world and it's really vital. So, so just kind of, you know, take a minute and think, yep, yep, not doing too bad. Yep, <laughs> there's more we can do, but it's really um, a beautiful kind of practice that we get to work on in this program. Okay, so um, this session we're going to look into the Wheel of Sharp Weapons text itself. Um, so we've been looking at some of the verses yesterday and um, just kind of getting to know the language and getting to know the framing of this text. Um, but now we're going to start at the very beginning and, um, and get the full context and kind of understand the main themes. So um, I made you a little presentation so that we can kind of get on top of the main themes together. So um, starting at the beginning, um, the Wheel of Sharp Weapons is a text in the thought transformation, Lojong tradition of Buddhism, um, though it was composed much earlier than the other texts of this tradition. So, you know, Geshe Lungri Tampa's Eight Verses of Thought Transformation, etc. These were all written later. So um, Atisha was the one that was kind of the one that popularized and brought and spread the mind training tradition, especially in Tibet. But his teacher, Dharma Rakshida, is who wrote the Wheel of Sharp Weapons. So in a way, he was kind of um, the founder of this tradition, although it, of course, came directly from the Buddha and the way of framing life in this way came directly from the Buddha. The karma teachings came directly from the Buddha. It was this teacher, Dharma Rakshida, um, who really popularized and um, clarified the Buddha's intention about, um, yeah, how to change the mind, how to reframe things. So um, Dharma Rakshita was an Indian master, and he composed this text somewhere in the end of the 10th century, uh, the beginning of the 11th century, and he was known for his great compassion and his Tonglen practice. There was a story about Dharma Rakshita that he had such great compassion, that he was so imbued with compassion that his own body became like medicine. And he saw someone with a terrible illness and he cut off a tiny piece of his skin and gave it to him and it cured him. You know, so it's one of these kind of magical Buddhist stories and you can take it or leave it. But the idea is that his body itself became medicine. There's other stories about him that, uh, he had a more literal and direct type of ability of Tonglen, that he could see the suffering of someone else and literally take it on. So if someone had a bruise on their leg, he would see it with compassion and then he would have a bruise on his leg. So, you know, whether you believe this is um, literal or um, analogous to his great compassion is really up to you. But the idea is that this teacher was known for great compassion but the text is incredibly fierce. So, so remember, this is coming from a mind of someone with incredible kindness. So much kindness, so much acceptance, so much love for sentient beings. And that is why he's presenting things so strongly for us, because he doesn't want us to suffer anymore. And he doesn't want us to hurt each other anymore. Okay, so that's Dharma Rakshita. Um, so it was practiced and popularized by his famous student, Atisha, as I mentioned. Um, Atisha is attributed to founding the Lam Rim tradition, um, the Lam Rim tradition that then Lama Tsongkhapa in the 14th century expounded upon. Um, so Atisha passed it to his Tibetan student, Dom Trumpa. And it's possible that Dom Trumpa is the one who actually wrote down the text um, as it appears only in Tibetan. It's not um, a text that you find in Sanskrit which says to us that it was probably orally transmitted up until it got to Tibetan teachers. So there was an oral transmission, um, you know, teacher to student, teacher to student, um, and then eventually it was written down and continued to be passed orally as well. But um, anyway, it exists originally in the Tibetan. You know, for the sake of lineage, I guess um, I could say that uh, this text was taught to my community uh, quite a few times by my teacher, Kensu Rinpoche Geshe Tashi Sering. Um, the first time I heard this text, I was a lay person. It was before I was a nun. And I remember it really moving my mind and really inspiring me to practice much more deeply. 
Um, at that point, I knew that I loved Buddhism and I knew that it was something that I wanted to give my life to in some way, but in reading The Wheel of Sharp Weapons, um, it kind of upgraded me, I guess, for lack of a better word. Um, it inspired me to let go of a few more miscellaneous habits and activities and distractions that I didn't really need anymore. I was just used to having. Um, so it was a very inspiring text for me early in my Dharma path. Um, and then later I heard the text again and it was taught, you know, kind of in the formal setting once again, and I was already a nun. <clears throat> and at that point when I heard it, it felt like my old friend who was there to protect me from myself. And that's the way I feel now every time I read it. It's like my old friend that gives me my own protection. So it's a, it's a very precious text to me personally. It's a very precious text in our tradition. Um, and so I hope you like it, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see, take it or leave it. Um, so the main themes in Wheel of Sharp Weapons are peacocks, poison, crows, the Wheel of Sharp Weapons, Yama and Yamantaka. Okay, so peacocks in this text are analogous to bodhisattvas. Poison is analogous to the danger of living in a samsaric environment and utilizing samsaric pleasures. Crows are analogous to cowardly beings motivated by self-cherishing. The wheel of sharp weapons is analogous to our actions being related to our current experience. Negative karma done becomes current suffering now. Yama and Yamantaka are the Lord of Death and the Slayer of the Lord of Death. Okay, so I'll help us unpack that a little bit. So peacocks are like bodhisattvas in you know, many ways, but five specific ways. The first one being, just as the colors of the peacock's feathers grow more radiantly beautiful when they eat plants that are poisonous to other animals, bodhisattvas shine with blissful happiness by making use of such poisonous delusions as desire and attachment for the benefit of others. So there's, whether it's mythology, mythology or whether it's science, um, I, you know, I did some Googling before <laughs> um, teaching this to see, can peacocks really eat poison? Is that really true? Does it make their um, feathers more beautiful? The, the jury's still out. Um, there does seem to be a, a, a case where peacocks do eat things, maybe even like snakes or different kinds of seeds and fruits that other animals can't eat. There does seem to be maybe some um, examples of that. But the point is the poetry, right? The poetry of it is instead of something dangerous hurting this being, it actually makes them even more beautiful. And that's what bodhisattvas are like, and that's what we'll be like. Um, just as peacocks have five crown feathers, bodhisattvas have the attainment of the five graded paths for enlightenment. So um, the path of accumulation, the path of preparation, the path of seeing, the path of meditation, the path of no more learning. The path of no more learning, of course, is full Buddhahood, but it's indicating where bodhisattvas are going. Just as the sight of a peacock's colorful display gives us great pleasure, the sight of a bodhisattva uplifts our mind because of their bodhicitta. So of course, we don't really know who has bodhicitta and who doesn't. You know, we can't read each other's minds. We can't assess each other's levels. But I think there are some people that we've met in our life that just by being with them, we are uplifted, not in an attached, excited way, but just in a deep contentment, almost like their deep contentment radiates out and is a condition for ours. Um, you know, someone like His Holiness the Dalai Lama, I think, has that quality where um, when he walks into the room, everyone is, a, is happier just by the side of him. And whether that's, you know, their projection and their assumption about who he is and what he represents, or whether that's because of who he is as a being, or the coming together of those two things, you know, it's, it's complex, as we talked about yesterday. Karma is incredibly complex. 
However, I think we do resonate with this idea that um, when someone's mind is filled with compassion and filled with love, filled with bodhicitta, there's an impression on us. Just as there's an impression on us if someone is full of anger or full of rage, we can sort of feel it when they walk into the room and that has an effect on us. So this kind of discussion of the poetry of this is to really kind of get us inspired to be this bodhisattva, to be this peacock-like being that, uh, you know, the light in the room brightens when we enter it, you know, because that can really help people with their path. So then just as peacocks live mostly on poisonous plants and never eat insects or cause them harm, evidently, <laughs> Bodhisattvas never cause even the slightest harm to other sentient beings. So the main point is that Bodhisattvas never cause harm even to the slightest, um, even to the slightest degree to other sentient beings. Um, what peacocks actually get up to, who can say? Scientists would tell us. Just as peacocks eat poisonous plants with pleasure, when Bodhisattvas are offered sensory objects, Although they have no attachment to these objects, they accept them with pleasure to allow the donor to gain merit from their offering. So, you know, sensory objects, you know, food, clothing, music, incense, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, you'll see this done for, um, you know, big teachers. You know, they'll arrive to a country and there'll be flowers and dancers and all of these things offered to this, you know, this being. And you think, do they really need all that? No, they don't need all that. <laughs> they don't need it at all. And yet it makes them happy that other people are being generous. So it's the same premise that we've talked about a lot, that you become receptive to what you respect and to get your mind into a respectful atmosphere. It's good to um, do physical actions to kind of demonstrate that. It helps get your mind in the right place, just like we set up this whole altar. No one needs that from the side of the Buddhas, but we need it to help become receptive to them. This helps us get into a mindset that says, this place and this moment and this situation are sacred. I must listen more deeply. This is important. I lean in like that. So bodhisattvas accept the offerings, not because they need them or want them particularly, but because it's good for the sake of the giver. And so if we're thinking about trying to become a bodhisattva, I think it's useful to sit with when people are giving us things, even if we don't want them, is there a deeper reason for accepting them? Is there a good reason to just for the sake of the giver to take it on board? Yeah, rather than say, oh, no, 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 I don't need that. You keep it. You take it for their sake. Now, it's not like um, you take it and, because you, and you know that they're going to be destitute because of it. You wouldn't do that. But if you know that this is important to them to offer it, then you take it because they need the merit. Yeah, so it's just, a, it's an interesting premise to sit with. So these are these kind of like five ways that bodhisattvas are like peacocks and the peacock analogy is going to keep cropping up throughout the text. So it's good to just get your head around it. And this list is in your course materials and in the back of the book as well. So the next main theme is poison. So this is analogous to the danger of living in a samsaric environment, utilizing samsaric pleasures. So the poison referred to, you know, specifically and literally is aconite or wolfsbane, which, um, you know, was used in a lot of Tibetan and Indian traditional medicines, which in large quantities is quite poisonous, but apparently in small quantities acts in a positive way on your system. Um, it's a little bit like uh, the concept behind a vaccine, you know, micro dosing, gradually building up an immunity so that things can't hurt you. But then the analogy takes it even further and says, not only does the poison not hurt the bodhisattva, it actually gives them strength. Meaning the sufferings of samsara don't damage the bodhisattva. The difficulties of samsara don't harm the bodhisattva and the pleasures and this is what's really important for us to think about is that when things are going well in samsara, that doesn't distract the bodhisattva from their path. That actually um, 
they have enough willpower, <laughs> they have enough strength of mind to um, use the happiness and the joys and the pleasures of samsara to amplify their bodhicitta and their compassion. If we're honest with ourselves, when we are really happy, especially attachment happy, we can lose track of some of our positive work. Yeah, we can kind of slip into an indulgent mode. Um, some people are very kind and compassionate when they're in professional work mode and become horrible when they're in holiday mode. Do you know some people like that? Or maybe you are like that, where when they've kind of clicked into professional, busy, I've got a lot of work to do, I've got a lot of stresses, I've got a lot of things in my schedule, and all of that is important and worthwhile, so I'm going to bring my best self to it. And they're wonderful professionally. And then you meet them personally or socially or in their holiday atmosphere. And it's like they let all of that slide and they become rude to waiters and waitresses. They become coarse to drivers and, you know, taxi drivers and doormen. And anyone they see as like less than or socially lower, they become arrogant and rude towards, you know. So they're, you know, they're using the kind of relief and happiness of being without work and enjoying that, and it actually then indulges their negative states of mind. So that's what can happen to us. For bodhisattvas, it does the opposite. Whether it's happiness or whether it's suffering, these things that can be poison to us actually are incredibly beneficial to the bodhisattva. Bodhisattvas are so lovely to be around. People like them, people are kind to them. And so when a bodhisattva finds a difficult person who really dislikes them and abuses them, a bodhisattva is happy to find a disagreeable person because now they have an opportunity to practice patience. So it's, it's a really um, intriguing way of reframing life. And so then we have crows, okay? So crows pop up throughout the text and uh, crows get a bad rep. And, um, of course, we know biologically crows are very intelligent creatures, but in this text, in the poetry of it, they're the bad guys, in the sense of they're the cowards, they're the ones that let themselves become absorbed in their self-cherishing and self-grasping. So crows are the cowardly beings, and what makes them cowardly, what makes them shrink, what makes them move away from difficulty, move away from compassion, is the two enemies, self-grasping and self-cherishing. So samsaric pleasures are poison to them because they use them with attachment, which leads them to suffer in the future. So we are, we are the crow a lot of the time. Occasionally, we're, you know, the nearly a bodhisattva, nearly a peacock, but a lot of the time we're the crow where we have an object of attachment and it gives us more and more and more attachment like drinking salt water to quench your thirst in 37 practices, remember? So um, the two enemies, self-grasping and self-cherishing, don't think they're the same thing. They're not the same thing. They work together, unfortunately, but they're not the same thing. So self-grasping, ignorance, there are a few types of self-grasping. Here, it's the form that is the root of samsara, and it directs self-cherishing, or it's why we have self-cherishing. Now, you can eventually remove self-grasping and still have self-cherishing remain. However, at our level, we have both. So self-grasping ignorance in this context refers to the reifying view of the perishing aggregates, the root of samsara. So the reifying view means to make concrete what you're observing. You're making it concrete. The perishing aggregates means the five aggregates are impermanent and changing. So you're reifying at something or making concrete or, or one or permanent, something that is actually changing moment to moment to moment. Um, you're viewing the I in your own mental continuum and holding it to exist inherently. Yeah, that's the root of samsara, that's the root of the, of the problem, that's the root of the suffering. 
So it's viewing the conventional eye. And if it was just viewing the conventional eye, that which is merely labeled by the mind on the collection of aggregates, if it was just viewing that, that wouldn't be as problematic. But what self-grasping does is it views that and then it superimposes or adds this idea that it inherently exists, that it independently exists from its own side. And so when you think that the self is self-existent, <laughs> when you think that the self is self-sufficient and substantially existent, when you think the self is true and real and just as it seems, then you have to protect it. If you saw that it was interdependent, if you saw that all the aspects of the self are interdependent, if you saw that everything was labeled on the basis of parts, etc., then there wouldn't be this same push and pull to try and gather things that support you and push away things that harm you because it wouldn't make sense anymore. It would be like trying to push different parts of your body off of itself. You know, you understand the body is a system. We are trying to see all sentient beings and the whole world as a system. The left hand is not the right hand, but they're part of the same system. And so it doesn't make any sense to say, I'm not talking to you left hand, I'm gonna push you away. You know, it's like, it's still connected even if I ignore it, even if I hurt it, even if I pull it closer, none of that makes sense if it's all the same system. So self-grasping is what gives us this illusion. Yeah, it gives us this veil over our eyes and we don't see reality clearly, which means we behave badly we plant the seeds of karma on our mental continuum, which then ripen as suffering. So self-grasping is cut by the wisdom realizing emptiness, but we don't have that yet. So because of our self-grasping, we wind up with self-cherishing. So self-cherishing refers to the destructive way of, quote, caring for the self. It's what this false self says that it needs. It doesn't need those things. Those things that self-cherishing wants actually are poison to it, but it feels very true and necessary when you're in it. So just be very clear that when you hear in Buddhism the word self-cherishing, think selfishness. Don't think, you know, a good practical looking after yourself. That's fine and good. When you hear self-cherishing, think they're referring to selfishness, self-centeredness being self-conscious, that, yeah. Um, so it's looking after one's own welfare with indifference to others. It takes no responsibility for alleviating their suffering. So this type, this first type that looks after one's own welfare with indifference and takes no responsibility for alleviating their suffering, this level of self-cherishing still exists for foundational vehicle arhats abiding in nirvana, the extreme of peace. Um, it's what prevents them from going to full omniscience, Buddhahood. So they are certainly not actively harming anyone and they do have love, they do have compassion. And in a sense, they help people who kind of enter into their sphere, but they're not proactively taking responsibility to alleviate suffering. They're abiding in peace. Um, it's said that eventually a Buddha will exhort them or wake them up or give them a shoulder tap and say, oi, finish your path. Um, but this type of self-cherishing can exist even after you've destroyed self-grasping. It's interesting. Um, for us, we also have um, even more strong self-cherishing that looks after one's own welfare, even at the expense of others. So not just with indifference, but actually this kind of fragile and volatile self-obsession that becomes very reactive. And in trying to get your needs met, you don't care who you hurt. If you're hurting others, you know, you kind of justify it in your mind or, or don't even notice. So self-cherishing is really our everyday troublemaker. Self-grasping is pervasive, it's always there with us, but self-cherishing is kind of the everyday troublemaker that's really obvious and coarse on the surface. And it's the thing we want to aggressively challenge with mind training, thought transformation practices like this one. Yeah, it's to really um, fiercely 
confront self-cherishing because it does nothing but trouble but it feels really necessary and important when you're believing it yeah so the antidote to self-cherishing is bodhicitta the antidote to self-grasping is the wisdom realizing emptiness we need both of them so just kind of get clear the two enemies self-grasping self-cherishing the word enemy is going to be used a lot in the text. When you, hear, when you see enemy, think these two. Usually it's referring to self-cherishing specifically, but um, later, tomorrow, when we do the ultimate bodhicitta verses, it's referring to self-grasping as well. These are our enemies. Okay, so then the next thing that we're looking at is the Wheel of Sharp Weapons itself. So this is analogous to our actions being related to our current experience. Negative karma done becomes current suffering experienced. So um, specifically in the imagery, it's either referring to like a chakram, which is a wheel that is a weapon, or it's referring to like a throwing star, you know, like ninjas use. Um, but the idea is that it comes back to us like a boomerang. Yeah, like um, Aboriginal Australians in some tribes used. Um, so the boomerang idea that, you know, what you've put out comes back to you, but it doesn't come back to you in a fun frisbee way. It comes back to you with cutting blades. It comes back to you and wounds you. So if you're feeling a wound, you threw it there, it came back. No one threw it at you but you. And that's what we want to keep hearing when we see, when we think the wheel of sharp weapons is returning. It's returning because you threw it. Yeah, so it behaves like a boomerang. And then um, the last main theme in the text that will come up are these ideas of Yama and Yamantaka. Yama, the lord of death. Yamantaka, the slayer of the lord of death. So the lord of death is karma and disturbing emotions, generally speaking. Yamantaka is wisdom and method or ultimate, ultimate bodhicitta, generally speaking. So Yama, you remember Yama from when we've talked about the, um, the wheel of life in the 12 links of dependent arising. So Yama is the scary monster holding the wheel of life. And so when you look at Yama, there's there's a few different levels of yama okay like everything in buddhism there's like a coarse medium and subtle kind of um, expression of the term or expression of the concept okay so the coarse level or the outer level of yama is seen to be some sort of literal being who lives seven levels beneath the earth um, in the south and wants to destroy sentient beings some sort of you know devilish being um, and of course, in Buddhism, anything that has sentience, anything that has mind, also has Buddha nature. Yeah, so if the great enlightenment is when everyone is enlightened, then maybe the last being we're waiting for is Yama himself to become enlightened. But right now, Yama, the lord of death, is this kind of creature who causes trouble, causes disturbance, um, hindrances and obstacles because he's so habituated his mind to negativity. Whether, again, you see it as kind of um, a metaphor for something, or you think of it kind of in a literal way or a folk story way, it's up to you. But the inner yama is what we're really looking at. The inner yama is longing desire. Longing desire. So um, sometimes I hear people use the word longing as if it's a good thing. <laughs> longing like nostalgia longing like oh please let this happen um longing is just a giant attachment story i so wish for you to be here you know i so wish for this to be present because your assumption is if i have them or this my quality of life will improve or i'll be happier because of it and once again we've given all the credit to the conditions and not looked at the substantial cause so the inner yama, longing desire, it's what gives us uncontrolled death. Yeah, it's what keeps the wheel going. Yeah, it's what keeps the 12 links going. 
you know, remember the 12 links, if there were a start, of course, there's beginningless time. But if there were a start, it would be ignorance. But then what maintains it and keeps it going around and around and around is desire. Yeah, longing desire. So that's the inner yama. The secret yama, secret in terms of very, very subtle, is dualistic appearances. Yeah, the illusion of subject and object. So the illusion of subject and object um, is something that pervades all, all of us who have not realized emptiness directly. Once you've realized emptiness directly, then um, the dualism doesn't appear to you while you're in meditative equipoise on emptiness, but it appears once again, once you're out of meditative equipoise on emptiness. So it's, it's an interesting thing to sit with. Um, dualism is something that we're trying to cut through in every way, at least by acknowledging the way I see things is illusory, you know, to at least acknowledge that, or at least acknowledge, probably I'm just dancing with my delusions most of the time, or talking to my own projections most of the time, or all of the time. Yeah. Okay. So Yamantaka then looks a little like Yama, but even scarier. Yamantaka is the slayer or the butcher of the Lord of Death. And he is um, representing the union of wisdom and method. He represents ultimate bodhicitta. He is the wrathful emanation of Manjushri, whose sort of wisdom cuts ignorance. Okay, so just like Yama, he's got, you know, different levels of meaning. So the um, interpretive meaning of Yamantaka is, you know, like this image you see here. This is a simplified image, you know, his fully fledged image. He has, you know, these nine faces, but also 34 arms and 16 legs, and he's holding all sorts of weapons. He's much scarier than Yama. But, but is the main thing. But he is completely compassionate completely wise. Um, why does he look so scary? <laughs> this is the question we want to ask ourselves. Why so scary, Yamantaka? Come back to that. So the interpretive um, Yamantaka is um, this wisdom of non-dual bliss and emptiness um, perceivable as the form of this deity. So, you know, we talk about this a lot that, you know, take a concept that we like, take a concept like love, and love can then manifest as a form like Maitreya. Take a concept we like, compassion. Compassion then manifests in a form like Avalokiteshvara, Chenrezig. So the form isn't the main thing, but the form helps us relate to the concept. It personifies the concept and makes it more relatable and engageable. It's archetypal. And the images themselves came from the enlightened mind. So there's particular significance in the iconography, which becomes like a teaching tool or a meditation manual just by looking at it. Yeah. So these images, um, these images are not accidental. These images are not purely artistic. Um, they all have significance, but the image is interpretive meaning. Yeah. It's not definitive. It's interpretable. Right. So then the definitive meaning of Yamantaka, the definitive meaning is the wisdom of all the Buddhas. Yeah, so when you see Yamantaka think wisdom, just like when you see Manjushri or you see Prajnaparamita, you think wisdom. These are embodiments of wisdom. He's wisdom in this wrathful form because sometimes we need wrath or um, an appearance of anger, not actual anger, but an appearance of anger to intimidate and subdue negative states of mind. We're not intending to, to intimidate or subdue people. No, not at all. We're not trying to harm them or oppress them or subjugate them, but we are trying to scare their afflictions into settling, specifically our own, yeah? But this is this whole concept of wrath. So if you're, you know, using your translation device to find out what is wrath, it's not going to give you the Buddhist definition. It's just going to say strong anger. In Buddhism, wrath has a specific meaning related to an appearance of anger, but not the motivation of anger. Yeah, wrathful 
is purified and transformed anger that still looks angry. Yeah, and so there's a lot of uh, imagery and words within the text that say slay him, trample him, cut him, etc., etc. A lot of kind of violent words. And what we're trying to do is to take the violence that exists in our mind, whether it's acknowledged or unacknowledged, the anger that exists in our mind, whether it's acknowledged or unacknowledged, and bring it forefront and look at the beast. Look at the beast in the eye and say, anger has a lot of energy in it. There's a lot of energy in anger. And when I'm angry, it just burns up my energy and exhausts me at the end. You know, if you've been angry all day, you're gonna be really stressed out and achy and feel crap the next day. What if we took all of that energy that you have when you're like boiling mad and took the wish to harm out of it? Yeah, anger is the wish to harm, right? So if you took the wish to harm out of the anger, but kept that powerful, volatile, um, boiling strength and tamed it, how powerful your love and compassion could be. You know, so imagine love and compassion as strong as that palpable feeling of when you're boiling with rage. It would be incredible. And that is why when you're with people like His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, he's just like radiating and blasting the room with love. You know, it's like a wave of love hits you, blows your hair back. You know, it's because he's taken energy that is so powerful, the energy of attachment, the energy of anger, all of the negative emotion energy, and he's taken the problem out but kept the power of it. So this is what we can do. And this is a good attitude to adopt, but it's not something that we should think that we have perfected unless we have renunciation and bodhicitta. So right now at our level, um, most of you aren't tantric practitioners. You, we've talked about tantric ideas and you can think about transformative tantric ideas but don't adopt the attitude that you're Yamantaka. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, it's something that requires a huge amount of stability, a huge amount of stability at the foundation. Stability in terms of your practice, not just kind of general mental health, which you all have, but um, a deeper level than that, which really is a palpable refuge, um, palpable, strong renunciation and bodhicitta. Then on top of that, you bring in Tantra and it has a really stable place to land. So if you're not Buddhist and you're never going to be Buddhist and you're never, or you are Buddhist, but you're never going to practice Tantra or not anytime soon, you can still think about these ideas though, can't you? You do it all the time in your work when you talk about transformation. So we say all the time, anger is never justified. Anger is wrong. Anger is to be eliminated. But what we're saying is, but it's also understandable. It's also natural in the sense of habitual. It's also going to keep coming up again and again. So let's have a number of tools in our tool belt to navigate this experience of this powerful emotion. Now let's have a lot of different tools. Sometimes we need Manjushri, just cutting through ignorance with the sword of wisdom. But he's still quite peaceful. Look at his sweet face. Yeah, he's still quite peaceful. He's got a little bit of a sword happening there. Yes, yeah, fiery flaming sword, but he's pretty chill about it. Um, Yamantaka's pretty scary looking. We don't need to bring out that kind of aspect very often. Um, but, you know, I remember there, there were times, especially when I was um, very newly ordained, but I had to organize different things and I was a bit intimidated to tell people what to do but it was my job to tell people what to do because I was managing the gompa, I was managing the temple. And when I would be really nervous and tentative and polite and say, oh, please, can you not do that? Oh, please, you know, when I was sort of sweet and tentative, people would just walk all over me. Um, and I talked to my teacher and I said, what do I do? I'm trying to be nice. I'm trying to be compassionate. Why won't they do what I like? Mm, they're going to hurt the gompa. I'm such a bad gompa manager, you know. And, um, and he said, you then, you be Yamantaka. And, um, you know, I was like, oh, okay. And, um, and then I really tried to adopt this attitude of just huge responsibility. But I was big enough to hold it. 
You know, this temple is important. What happens in this temple is important. Therefore, what I'm saying as an advocate for the temple is important. I'm going to say it strongly and powerfully, but with a really kind and compassionate heart. And so I would say, you know, the best I can, right? So I would say that troublemaking people, you can't do that with a smile, but like you can't. <laughs> and if you keep doing it, there will be a consequence. Um, and people would say, oh, sure, yeah, sorry. No big deal. So it's, you know, it's assertiveness, but it's assertiveness with a very powerful core of strength that is bigger than your own negative states of mind, bigger than the negative states of mind of others. And because it's bigger, it can hold more and not be rattled. So wrath is an interesting kind of thing to think about. Yeah, so it's one of the big themes within this text. Okay, so we begin. This is the beginning of the text. So if you wanna look at your text or if you wanna just look at the screen, we're at the very beginning. So the very first part before we even get into the verses, um, in your book, it's, um, it's just on page what, beginning? <laughs> yeah, page one. So it says, the name of the work, the wheel of sharp weapons, effectively striking the heart of the foe. I pay heartfelt homage to you, Yamantaka. Your wrath is opposed to the great Lord of Death, the Lord of Death, Yama. Yeah, so now the imagery is starting to make sense. Okay, so then verse one, in the jungles of poisonous plants strut the peacocks, though medicine gardens of beauty lie near. The masses of peacocks don't find gardens pleasant, but thrive on the essence of poisonous plants. So these beautiful gardens or these medicinal gardens it could be, you know, you have the merit, you have the good karma, you have the conditions to live the easy life, um, but you choose to enter into the fray. You choose to go into the environment where there is difficulty and hardship and you thrive. So in a way, we're all like this a little bit. You know, we could live easier than we do. We could do work that isn't as challenging as the work that we do. And we're probably all smart enough that we could make a fairly good living, a fairly good amount of money, um, and have an easier life than we have now. We could, but we've chosen difficult work, and we're actually thriving because of it, because these challenges bring out the best in us. So then, in a similar fashion, the brave bodhisattvas remain in the jungle of worldly concern. No matter how joyful this world's pleasure gardens, these brave ones are never attracted to pleasures, but thrive in the jungle of suffering and pain. And so the footnote says, bodhisattvas are brave ones. The spiritual offspring of the Buddhas are those beings who have developed the enlightening attitude bodhicitta to work toward the attainment of Buddhahood that is enlightenment for the sake of all beings. We spend our whole lives in search for enjoyment, yet tremble with fear at the mere thought of pain. Thus, since we are cowards, we are miserable still. But the brave bodhisattvas accept suffering gladly and gain from their courage a true lasting joy. Now, desire is the jungle of poisonous plants here. Only brave ones, like peacocks, can thrive on such fare. If cowardly beings, like crows, were to try it, because they are greedy, they might lose their lives. So this verse has a lot in it. And so it says in the first footnote, three, there are three levels of training the mind according to the three scopes of motivation outlined in the Lamrim teachings of the graded course to enlightenment. With the initial scope motivation, we work to attain a better future rebirth. With an intermediate scope, we work to attain liberation from the vicious circle of rebirth for ourselves alone. With an advanced scope as a follower of the Mahayana path with bodhicitta motivation, we work to attain full enlightenment of Buddhahood for the benefit of all beings. So these three scopes, this is the scope of your motivation. 
is the scope of your motivation, initial, intermediate, or advanced, but it's also the scope of your ability. So they might not synchronize, right? It could be that we have an advanced scope or a great scope motivation, but our practice and our ability is still at the initial scope or even preliminary to the initial scope. And that's okay. So when you look at the three scopes, what we're looking at is twofold. What is the scope of your ability? And what is the scope of your motivation? So whatever your current ability is, you're trying to have the greatest motivation possible because that greatest motivation will pull you quicker to that. So then the word now, yeah, now is the first word of that verse in the text indicates the importance of practicing the teachings with an advanced scope of motivation, having previously trained our mind along Lamrim graded course. Lamrim being a stages of the path. And then the number four footnote, with an advanced scope motivation, there are two ways in which we can follow the Mahayana path. By following the perfection vehicle, the Paramita Yana, it may take lifetimes before we reach our goal of enlightenment. Two, by following the tantric vehicle, Vajrayana, however, we may attain enlightenment within one human lifetime. The word here in the text indicates the immediacy of practicing the tantric path when especially strong bodhicitta motivation. So bodhicitta is the reason for tantra. Yeah, that's the mantra we have to have. Bodhicitta is the reason for Tantra. Not because Tantra is exotic or fun or prettier or whatever, but the reason for Tantra is that beings are suffering now in a way that we don't know what to do with. So if we were Buddhas now, we would know more what to do. So of course, if you follow the perfection vehicle, you'll also become a Buddha. It's just going to take a huge longer amount of time. Um, it's still good, it's still wonderful, it's still necessary. However, if we want to get the job done quickly, practicing Tantra is the quickest path. And it's also hard, you know, it's the quickest because you're, achieve, you're gathering so much merit, so much mental momentum in such a short period of time that um, of course it's going to be challenging. Of course it's going to be challenging. But that challenge can be incredibly enriching and quite, um, I don't know, engaging as well. But again, it requires a really strong foundation. Um, otherwise, Tantra becomes something that makes you worse and not better. Yeah, so if you're starting to navigate disturbing emotions differently, transforming them rather than antidoting them, the danger is that you lie to yourself. The danger is you say, oh, I'm not angry, I'm wrathful. Oh, I'm not desirous, I've transformed it. You know, that, that's the danger in practicing Tantra too soon is that you say that you're transforming a negative state of mind when in fact you're indulging it, but putting the right words on top of it. So it requires a lot of self-honesty, but um, you know, for those of you that are Buddhist um, and are thinking about Tantra, it's never going to be perfect before you start. You're never going to know everything before you start. So, it, you know, if you feel ready, if you feel like you've got enough sense of renunciation and bodhicitta, if you like the teacher and have a connection with the teacher giving the empowerment, go ahead and do it. It's never going to be perfect. And then once you have the empowerment, you can study and learn more and ask more questions and, you know, clarify and tidy up things as you go. So we all start a little bit kind of clunky and inelegant, and then, you know, you just need to actively engage with teachings um, to increase your understanding and ability to practice it. Okay, so then five, the tantric system teaches many methods for the speedy attainment of enlightenment, including among them is the use as a path, the normally poisonous delusions. In order to use delusions, such as lustful desire, as a path. However, we must first be devoid of the self-cherishing attitude, that is the greedy attachment to our own self-interest. So, um, you know, we must be devoid of them or without them, or at least successfully manage them enough. <laughs> yeah. Ideally, you've cut it all out, but um, practically speaking, you at least know how to navigate it. In addition, we must have a sound understanding of voidness or the emptiness of inherent existence. 
the fact that all things, including ourselves, lack a truly, truly independent manner of existence. To use delusions as a path without these two prerequisites is extremely dangerous and far from achieving our intended goal, we may completely destroy our chance for attaining enlightenment. Now, of course, you can't completely destroy your chance for attaining enlightenment completely, but if you practice Tantra without also the wisdom realizing emptiness, at least an intellectual understanding, then again, you start grasping and getting fundamentalist and misunderstanding things. So then verse five, so how can someone who cherishes self more than others take lust and such dangerous poisons for food? If he tried like a crow to use other delusions, he would probably forfeit his chance for release. So the footnote says, any of the delusions may be used in the Tantra system as an actual path to enlightenment. In the perfection vehicle, the delusions may only be used as a method for directly benefiting others when the circumstances demand it. They may not, however, be practiced as an actual path. So just warnings to crows or warnings to us when we are crow-like. And thus bodhisattvas are likened to peacocks. They live on delusions, those poisonous plants, transforming them into the essence of practice they thrive in the jungle of everyday life. Whatever is presented, they always accept while destroying the poison of clinging desire. Uncontrollable wandering through rounds of existence is caused by our grasping at egos as real. This ignorant attitude heralds the demon of selfish concern for our welfare alone. We seek some security for our own egos we want only pleasure and shun any pain. But now we must banish all selfish compulsion and gladly take hardship for all others' sake. All of our sufferings derive from our habits of selfish delusions we heed and act out. As all of us share in this tragic misfortune, which stems from our narrow and self-centered ways, we must take all our sufferings and the miseries of others and smother our wishes of selfish concern. Should the impulse arise now to seek our own pleasure, we must turn it aside to please others instead. For even if loved ones should rise up against us, we must blame our self-interest and feel it's our due. And the footnote here should be, don't be a martyr. That's not what's being said. You're allowed to be happy, happiness will come. What's being challenged here is the concept of seeking, seeking it, yeah? So turning it aside to please others instead, you're not seeking to be successful in that pleasing of them with a, a sense of attachment and expectation. You're seeking to please them in the sense of offering them conditions which might ripen their seeds for happiness which may or may not work because you don't have clairvoyance and you don't know which conditions will water which seeds. However, it's about the intention. And so then we get into the verses about some of the wins. There's other wins that we did yesterday, but um, this is the, the beginning of talking about Tonglen specifically in this context. So verse 10 is, when our bodies are aching and racked with great torment of dreadful diseases we cannot endure. This is the wheel of sharp weapons returning, full circle upon us from wrongs we have done. Till now, we have injured the bodies of others. Hereafter, let's take on what sickness is theirs. So hereafter, let's take on what sickness is theirs. This is an indication that having understood these previous ideas, you know, verses one through nine, now practice Tonglen, practice giving and taking. Depressed and forlorn, when we feel mental anguish, this is the wheel of sharp weapons returning full circle upon us from wrongs we have done. Till now we have deeply disturbed the minds of others. Hereafter, let's take on this suffering ourselves. And so therefore practice Tonglen. 
And so we'll go ahead and practice Tonglen now. So if you want to get into a meditation posture. And so we we'll just take a minute and um, let the mind settle and recalibrate before we jump into Tonglen. And really make sure that your posture is holding you, that it doesn't feel like you're holding it. So just shift around until it feels like you're very balanced. And so with the aspiration to be the peacock in the poison grove, shift your focus to the breath. And just watch the breath, simple and steady. Lots of thoughts and impressions might occur to you, or you might feel a bit stirred up and overwhelmed. You might feel happy or inspired. And whatever you're feeling, just decide that's not my main focus right now. We'll just very gently watch the breath and watch the breath and watch the breath.
And now shift to a very gentle analysis and pick one thing happening in your body right now that you wish was not the case. Something a little bit uncomfortable, an ache or a pain or a fatigue or an itch. And just scan through the body and find something uncomfortable. And as you find that place of discomfort within your body, think this is the wheel of sharp weapons returning full circle upon me from harms I have done. In the past, I have harmed the bodies of others or deprived them of resources, made them uncomfortable. Hereafter, may I never harm the bodies of others. And then as you experience your own discomfort, decide that this is something I would like to experience on behalf of all sentient beings who have the same discomfort or pain. So instead of trying to reject this pain, give it to your self-cherishing attitude. Take it from all sentient beings. If it's your lower back is aching, think, may I have the lower back pain of all sentient beings? Let me take it from them. Let me experience it instead of them. May I hold it for them. May their negative karma ripen upon me. And then breathe in to the area of pain with your breath, breathe it into that space Really experience the vividness of that discomfort. But as you experience the vividness of that discomfort, try to adopt the attitude of courage, knowing that your mind is strong enough to cope with this discomfort without letting this discomfort agitate it. Adopting the attitude that you experience this discomfort on behalf of all sentient beings means that you don't inflict your discomfort on them because of your affliction response. It means that your heart is open toward them when you see them suffering the same way. There's affinity, empathy, connection. And then if you can, if you feel enough de-identified from your self-cherishing thought, Speak to your self-cherishing thought by saying, is this what you wanted, this pain we have now? You're the one that gave it, take it back. The pain came from the self-cherishing thought, give it back to the self-cherishing thought, diminishing it 
with the power of your bodhicitta. And just keep breathing into that area of pain. And now breathing out any relief, joy, positive karma, sending it to those sentient beings suffering. Breathing in their suffering, giving it to your self-cherishing thought, breathing out loving kindness and compassion, sending them joy. In suffering, out happiness. The wheel of sharp weapons is returning anyway. Let's make it useful. Not only exhausting negative karma, but also generating huge amounts of positive karma and possibly even being a strong condition to relieve the suffering of sentient beings in this very moment particularly those we have strong karmic connection with. Taking on the in-breath, giving on the out-breath. And then shift from the body to the mind and choose one medium-sized worry, something that's troubling your mind a little bit in the background, something about finances or relationships, home maintenance. Try not to go into something deeply existential or something that's too minor, too minor to matter. Just choose a middling worry. And then think this worry came from the self-cherishing thought. Of course, there are many other conditions, things that make the situation difficult, reasons why your mind is reactive to it. However, at the core, it was self-grasping and then self-cherishing that gave you this agitation of the mind. something narrow in your focus.
And so allow the mind to expand by thinking, not only will I take this worry and give it to my self-cherishing thought, I will also take this worry from every single sentient being who has the same worry or something similar. Instead of pushing it away, I will pull it toward. On the in-breath, you pull it back in together with everyone else's. You give it to the self-cherishing thought, weakening it. You breathe out happiness. your merit, roots of virtue, positive karma. Breathing in the suffering, breathing out the happiness. Every round of breath, helping you to exhaust your negative karma. Every round of breath, increasing your compassion. Every round of breath, increasing the power of yourself as a condition to relieve the suffering of sentient beings. And then with the last few breaths, imagine that the self-cherishing thought has been very subdued, that it's shrunk, letting go its hold, and that your mind is freed up, flexible and expansive. Your gaze widened to hold every living being with compassion. Every living being, including yourself. And then we dedicate using verse 49 as it's true what I've said about self-centered interest. I recognize clearly my enemy now. I recognize clearly the bandit who plunders, the liar who lures by pretending he's part of me. Oh, what relief that I've conquered this doubt. May we awaken and develop our potential for the benefit of all living beings. Okay.